Well, do you have your Bibles today? Have you got your Bibles? Okay. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles um, to turn with me to the book of Genesis. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 18. This being Father's Day, I want to give a, an encouraging word not only to our fathers, but to everyone. But maybe it would have special application for the dads today. Because fathers and uh, husbands are priests of the home. That's, that's a very clear teaching in the scriptures that, that they are to be the priests of the home. And one of the duties of the priests um, was that of being intercessor. And being the one that would, would be in particular um, bringing needs to God on behalf of others. And so I would say to you dads and um, husbands and fathers that uh, let's, let's be the priests. And we all are. All right, We're all um, a kingdom of priests to the Lord. And so everyone is, in, is going to be involved in this ministry, but especially... I want to encourage dads today to take up that mantle of being the intercessor. And I want to speak on the importance of prayer. This is a very uh, basic but yet an important message for us because we are facing times now, church, that in many ways are, are unprecedented, certainly in, our li in most of our lifetimes, if not all of them. There are things that are going on that call for the church to be the church. And uh, I mentioned earlier in the week on Facebook, I said, you know, sinners will become Christians when Christians become Christian. And one of the things that we have to do is we've got to get back into or be stronger in the prayer closet portion of our ministry. And we want to see fruit come from that. Every Christian should be a praying Christian. In fact, if, you, if you're not praying, you're playing. And, and, there's, and, and we have to be in this posture. We're, we're not in a place today where we can just play games. Everything has changed. Everything is upside down. People are dying. You know, things are going on in this world and in our country that demand that we as believers take a stand for the Lord. And that we, that we utilize those things that God has called us to utilize. And so I take you to Genesis chapter 18 with that little bit said as kind of an introduction and I want us to look at a particular incident that took place in the life of Abraham and what he did. And I'm not going to uh, go into a long introduction of the text itself. I think it will basically speak for itself. But Abraham has been speaking really with the Lord in the Old Testament. There are times where the Lord appears um, uh, as, if you would, an, an angelic being, but yet a man at the same time. And here the Lord has basically had time with Abraham, and he's appeared um, in the form of men. And so verse 16 tells us, in chapter 18, that then the men rose from there, and they looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And you have to know Sodom was the most evil city um, anywhere in that vicinity. It was known for its, its, its absolute vileness and wickedness. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord and do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there, and they went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near, and he said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said to him, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, I'll spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and he said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. 
Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? So the Lord said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again, and he says, well, suppose there would be 40 found there. I won't do it for the sake of 40. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Then he said, indeed, now I've taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. And so the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. I want us to be encouraged in our prayer life today because what we see in this story is that God hears his people when they call to him and when they make requests and especially in regards to intercession. God does listen and God does hear and God does respond based on intercession. I would ask you quickly, how many people here have family members that are not saved that you are praying for their salvation? Let me see your hand. Okay. Just about every single one of us here. We have family, if not family, surely friends or neighbors that we know that need Jesus Christ. And so we are called to be the priests and to stand in the gap and to do exactly what Abraham did. And today I want to give you five simple very, very important, but very, very simple reasons that we need to pray and really how we can pray effectively if we will incorporate these five requirements. So if we want to pray effectively, there, and there are at least these five things that are essential for us today. And we want to be like Abraham and we want God to be able to hear us. And we want, I mean, do you want answers to your prayers? Yeah. No. We don't want to just go through the motions. That's crazy. Oh, I'm just praying. It's just a religious exercise. I don't expect any answer. I don't expect anything. Well, the scripture is pretty clear that if that's the way we approach God, we won't get anything. God's pretty clear, isn't he? Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So I don't, I, I'm trusting none of us here want to just go through because I will tell you straight up, if we're, not serving, if we're not serving the true and the living God, if the God that we claim to know and the God that we say has saved us and he has saved us, if, if none of this is real, then you want to talk about just doing foolish stuff. We're just wasting our time, spinning our wheels if this isn't real. So I hope that when we pray, we pray with a faith and a belief that God is listening because we know that he is and that he is hearing us and that he will, he will actually act on behalf of those that intercede. So I say that to you right at the outset that the only reason to even go through this and to talk about prayer is because it is real. Because what Abraham did, it's real. God listened. And God listens today. But let's kind of firm that up in our mind that, that, that we're, we're, prayer is not just a religious exercise, but it actually is communion, fellowship, speaking both to the Lord, but also the Lord speaking to us, a two-way conversation. Amen? Let's, let's remember those things. But five, five important factors to effective praying is what I want us to look at today. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I just pray today in the simplicity of this message that you would grant to us eyes to see and ears to hear what your Holy Spirit would say to us today. Lord, that we would be willing to, uh, Lord, receive and to hear from you and um, to grow in our prayers, to grow in our praying and our understanding of these things, Lord. Let, let your spirit speak to your people today. Raise up prayer warriors. Raise up intercessors. Brian Assembly, we have, have been a praying church from the very beginning, God. And, we, and you have brought us through so many of the, of the trials of life and situations, and you have kept us, and we are here. And we're here for a mission. We have a purpose and a big part of that is to be intercessors. So would you raise up intercessors? Would you remind us of this great privilege that we have today to pray to you? I ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. amen. And amen. The Lord is good. So for a car to work, there are many parts within it, right? Those of you that are mechanics. 
And, and if, uh, if, if all of the parts are not functioning properly, oftentimes the car not, will not work. Is that right, Brother Wayne? Okay. So it's not just that, well, we need gas in the car. That's great. We do need gasoline in the car. But if there are things going on under the hood that are not related to the, the gas, but there are other issues within it, it still won't work. Something as simple as the battery, right? You need the battery or you need something to jump the car. You need alternator. I mean, there's a lot of parts to a car, many things that have to all be working in conjunction. And so it is with effective praying. And that's why these five things that I'm going to share with you all have to be a part, I believe this, have to be a part of our life functioning for our prayers to be effective. And so I want to share these five with you with that thought in mind. The first one is um, the prayers have to come from the heart of a person that has a sincere, true faith. There must be sincere, true faith coming forward if we're going to see God do anything. Abraham clearly had that. He knew he was speaking to the Lord, didn't he? He understood, and that's why he actually said, he, as he kept bringing to God, well, what if it's not 50? What if it's 45? What if it's 40? What if it's 30? What if it's 20? What if it's 10? You notice that he did so with a respect because he knew he was actually speaking to God. He wasn't just speaking to another person that he could kid around with. This was serious stuff. This was a nation that was going to, I mean, a city that was going to perish off the face of the earth. It's serious stuff. He, by the way, had, um, you know, somewhat of a, uh, of a part in this because he's got family that's there in the city. So he doesn't want to see his family members perish. We didn't even talk about that, but, you know, Lot and his family were there. So Abraham has skin in this, and he speaks to God. And he speaks truthfully and he speaks sincerely. And we need to have um, sincere, true faith if we're going to come to God and see effective praying. Can I just share a couple of scripture with, scriptures with you? Mark eleven twenty four. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, everything that you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it and it shall be yours. So, so the faith has to be real. It has to be sincere, doesn't it? Again, Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. And so there's some imagery there, but the, the reality of it is, is that we need to be able to come to God with a clean conscience, a sincere, true faith. James 1, 6, he must ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. So if we're going to ask God to do anything, we need to believe that the Lord will actually do it. There needs to be a sincere, true faith that becomes a part of, of our prayers. So what does this mean? All of this deals with relationship to one degree or another. Our prayers will be as effective as our relationship with God is. So, we have the story of Aladdin's lamp. Our Heavenly Father is not a genie in a lamp. Our Heavenly Father is not Santa Claus. Our Heavenly Father, our relationship in terms of prayer and intercessory prayer, we cannot approach it just as, well, here's somebody that's just going to give me some nice stuff, right? So we had this uh, stimulus package thing, and, and, and everyone just got, basically, we got free money, Right? Unless you didn't take it and, and you're really super holy and you didn't use it and send it back, great, that's wonderful. You didn't need it, whatever. And that's good. If you, if you really didn't need it, that's great. But it just came. It's just, boom, we're going to do this, and here it comes to people. Um, God is not, you know, just like, we're not to look at God as a uh, bank up in heaven that we can now let me go and withdraw my deposits. Let me rub the lamp and the genie will come out and just ask God whatever I want him to. That's usury. Have you got friends that, that are not really friends, but they're people that only come to you when they want your wallet to open up? Yes or no? Anybody ever felt like that? If you have kids, come on. Sometimes that happens. All right? So we've all, we've all noticed this. And, and what, how does that make you feel? It's like this is usury. This person is using me. Do you think God wants to be used? Is that why Jesus came to die on Calvary? Just to open up the floodgates so that people could come and use him? No. There must be a sincere true faith that is a part of our intercession. And so there was a TV show years ago, Gilligan's Island. If you don't know what Gilligan's Island is, then first of all, I feel sorry for you because you haven't really lived. But anyhow, 
Gilligan's Island was a little sitcom and uh, seven castaways on this island and it's just it was just a, a comedy show, a, a fluff funny show. And one day, sure enough, there's, um, as they're there, they, uh, on Gilligan's Island, they find a, a gym. And Gilligan finds it. And they, they realize that, I guess there's a legend or something, that whoever finds this gym gets three wishes granted to them. And so Gilligan finds the gym, and Gilligan being the one that causes all the havoc and is not as smart and everything else, he two times in a row just without thinking, says, boy, I wish I had some ice cream. And so, boom, all of a sudden, out from a plane or somehow, here comes just a little, a, a gallon or so of ice cream, you know, uh, uh, and, and it comes to him. And so, oh, wow, here's some vanilla ice cream. And then the next time, here's some chocolate ice cream, whatever it was. He wastes two wishes on just saying, I wish I had some ice cream, just because he said it. Oh, uh, hey, hey, you say it. You get what you say, right? So this was kind of the mindset. So then finally, everybody's telling him, listen, listen, don't waste your last wish. we got to get home. you got to use it to get us off the island, right? And so they all come, and they stand out in the lagoon area on the sand right by the lagoon. And, okay, Gilligan, we're all here. We're packed. Wish us back home. And so he says, okay, I wish that we were all off this island. And so what happens is the little portion of sand that they're on cracks open and floats out into the middle of the lagoon and stops. Well, they were off the island. Now, I, I say all that to you because it's kind of comical and we say, wow, if he just would have worded it differently, then it would have happened. Sometimes we get, you know, sometimes the teaching comes that, well, you know, it's just, it's, it's all about your words, and you better word it properly, or else God's going to give you something bad. That's not the relationship God has with his children. Can you imagine if your children came to you, or if, uh, yeah, if your children came to you and said they wanted something and they misspoke, they're a little child, they don't know what they really want, and, and they misspeak, and they say they want something that is bad for them, are you going to say, I'm going to give it to you. You want it, here you go. I'd like to, Dad, I'd like to stick my fork into the light socket. Can I do that? You said I could have whatever I wanted. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Stick the, no. God doesn't work that way either. There has to be a sincere, true faith that is, is measured on who God is. Our faith is in God, and that means our faith is in his character and in his nature. Abraham knew he could approach the Lord because the Lord was loving and kind and merciful, and he knew, I, I'm going to, I believe I can approach God and ask him, will you not destroy the city if there are less than 50 people in it? Less than 40, 30, 20. And, and so it's important that you and I understand right off the bat that we must have a faith, but that that faith is in God. It's not faith in faith. There's some that, that teach that, and, and that's not really the way it works. So, well, I've got more faith than you do. Yet Jesus said if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed. You know how small a mustard seed is? Pretty small. If the size of our faith is what was required as to whether or not we would get answers, I tell you right now, most of us would be in trouble. It's faith in God. It's not faith in our faith. It's faith in, I believe the Lord. I trust him. I believe his word. And I'm going to go by his word. Amen? This is just, I'm throwing this in. This is a little bit extra for you. Because there is some teaching out there that they, they give you the impression that somehow you've got to work up your faith. And you've got to have faith in your faith. In fact, I've heard some go so far as to say that God, he doesn't actually have the power in himself. There's something called faith that God taps into. And God tapped into faith to create the worlds and create the universe. If you ever hear anything like that, you need to be able to go back to your Bible and say, that's not the way it works. God comes before everything else. There's, there's nothing else outside of God. Everything came from God and through the Lord. And we need to understand that. So our faith is in God. Okay, very quickly. I'll move quickly through these, ne these next four. Our, our prayers must be in Jesus' name. What does that mean? Does that mean if I just tack in Jesus' name onto the end of a prayer, it automatically validates it? That's not really what it means. What it means is by saying in Jesus' name, we're saying by and through and under his authority. In other words, the authority of our petition, of our coming to the Father, is through Jesus Christ. It's not through ourselves or in ourselves. It's only through him. See, when we get saved, we legally become the children of God. We're, we're his children now. We can say, Abba, Father. We can cry out to God and say, God, I now... And because of that, listen to me. 
If, if someone goes down to the bank and they want to make a withdrawal, and they're not on the, the list of people that can make a withdrawal, it doesn't matter that they just walk down, yeah, but, but I say this person's name. You know, I want whoever the, the richest person is walk into the bank. Well, you know, I'm a friend of so-and-so's, and so I would like some money. They're not releasing money that way. The only way it works is if you're on the list, and generally that comes through relationship, right? It's because there's a relationship, and the bank understands, yes, you're legally a part of this. You can withdraw funds. It's the same with the Lord. We come in Jesus' name, meaning I'm with the Lord. I'm with him. I'm his. I, he's in me. I'm in him, the, the branch and all of that good stuff. And so I'm with the Lord. You say, I'm not sure I believe that. Listen to me. John 14, 13 through 14. Whatever you ask, Jesus said, in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And how about in Acts chapter 19? We actually know about this situation. Remember that uh, as uh, Peter and Paul and the other uh, apostles and disciples were going out. They were that signs and wonders were taking place. And one of the things that would happen is that people that were demon possessed would be set free from that oppression and that possession. And we have an interesting situation in Acts chapter 19 where you have these itinerant Jewish exorcists. This is what they did for a living. And they saw what Paul was doing and how demons were coming out of people as Paul would proclaim things in Jesus' name. And apparently there was a man there um, uh, in, their, in their area that was possessed with multiple evil spirits. And they attempted, we're told this in Acts chapter 19 and verse 13, that they attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And this is what they said. I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches, come out of this man. These are seven sons of Sceva is who, is, is who they were. And, and, um, and they were sons of the high priest, of the Jewish high priest. So, the, so they thought, we have the authority. You know, our dad's a high priest. We can go and we can do this. We heard this Paul guy having some pretty good, you know, success by using the name of Jesus. So they go to this man, demon-possessed. Everyone knows the guy's demon-possessed. We adjure you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out of him. And guess what happens? The man who had the evil spirits answered and said to them, and it was really the spirits speaking through the man because he's possessed. And what did the spirits say? They say, well, we know Jesus. And we recognize Paul. We know about this guy, Paul. He's, he's, a, he's hurting us. But you guys, we don't know you at all. And it says they jumped, this one man jumped on all seven of them and whipped them. And, and, I mean, just ripped them apart. And they had to run out of there bleeding and everything else. I mean, he, he just whipped them. Because the, the demons inside said, listen, we know Jesus. And we know Paul. But we don't know you. In other words, you have no authority. It's not just about pronouncing a name. It's about relationship. But you and I, when we are children of God, and when we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we can walk in His name, and we can come forward and say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have God's promise that He will hear, and He will answer, that the Son might be glorified, that the Father might be glorified. Amen? Amen. And we can praise God and thank God for that. So our prayers have got to be with a true, sincere faith, and they must be in Jesus' name. Then thirdly, it must be God's will. 1 John 5.14 says, This is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. In Matthew 6.10, Jesus said it. This is basic. This is what we call the Lord's Prayer. And it's really the model for us to pray. And the ending of the Lord's Prayer is, Your kingdom come, my will be done. Oh, your will, meaning the Father's will be done. We have to pray in God's will. It has to be God's will. As much as I would like Publishers Clearinghouse to knock on my door tomorrow morning and present me with the what, if that's not God's will for my life, I can pray it all I want to, but I'm not going to twist God's arm. Do we really think we're going to twist God's arm? This is why we have to pray in God's will. This is important. You say, well, then how do I know I can pray for people to be saved? Because we have it written out for us, told explicitly, it is not God's will that any perish, but that all come to eternal life. 
So when I intercede, as Abraham did, or where you, when you do, for your, whoever it is in your family or your friend, you can pray in full assurance knowing it is God's will to save that person. He doesn't want anyone to perish. We can pray that with absolute, complete, 100% assurance. God wants this. And this is why John says, if we pray according to his will, we know that he hears us. It's important that we know what God's will is. It's important that we know what God's word actually says. Amen? So it's got to be God's will. So one time a man was preaching and he got everybody fired up and he was preaching on faith and just, oh, and everybody was fired up. And all of a sudden a young man jumps up in the middle of his sermon. Everybody's so excited. And he says, brother, and he's speaking to the guest evangelist, the Lord just told me to run through that wall. God told me to run through that wall. I've got faith. I'm going to run through that wall. And the, the preacher just said, well, okay, go ahead. So the guy gets up a, a head of steam, and everybody's watching, runs, hits that wall, full steam ahead, boom, hits the wall, boom, hits the ground. <laughs> Unspectacularly, maybe totally to your shock and surprise, the wall did not move. He moved, and he went down to the ground. So then he, he dusted himself off. Everybody's watching, waiting. What in the world? Are we going to have to call the ambulance for this guy? He gets up. He's kind of woozy. But then he regains consciousness and shakes off the cobwebs. And he says, brother, the Lord just told me never to do that again. <laughs> we have to know what God's will is. And then we pray in accordance with his will. Amen. And if you say, I'm not really sure, then this is where we finish off the prayer. And we say, now, Lord, if it be your will. If we don't have a scriptural standard, let's say you're thinking about a job and you don't know, is this really what God wants? Lord, if it be your will, open this door. Let this happen. If it's not your will, then close the door. And, and I am in accordance with your will. Not what I want, what you want. Amen? And we do that. Now, fourthly, there's another thing close to the prayer being in God's, or, or being God's will. You and I must be living in God's will if we want our prayers to be effective. In other words, our relationship with the Lord. We need to be in right relationship with him and not completely backslidden and just doing our own thing. Again, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. 1 John 3, 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because why? We keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. We are showing ourselves. We're, we're, we're not making ourselves holy. God's already made us holy. We're in right relationship with him. But we're walking with him like a, a good child would do. Amen? And so there are bratty kids, and there are children that love their parents and demonstrate that by doing what the parent asked them to do. Amen? And so we're walking with the Lord because of his love for us and because of what he's done for us. And as we're walking in his will, then the door is wide open for us to pray. Interesting. Psalm 66 and verse 18. Many of us will know this by uh, by heart. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will what? Will he hear us? He will not hear us. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the psalm says, the Lord will not hear me. Okay, now I want you to, to get, I, I, I went and looked at a couple of different translations to get the sense of this. And I just want to read a couple of these to you because they all communicate the same sense. So another one says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Or if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Another one says, if I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And finally, another one says, if I had ignored my sins, the Lord would not have listened to me. All of that's true. We need to be walking in the will of God ourselves if we really want that open line of communication with the Lord. doesn't mean that you're perfect. I'm not saying that, that you're perfect. In, in the sense of just never, no sin in word, thought, or deed, and no sin of commission or omission or anything. But there should be the right relationship. If we're walking in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with one another. Amen? And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So as long as I'm walking in the light, even if there are unintentional sins and there are things that happen, there's a continual cleansing. This is why I don't worry about whether or not I'm saved tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Oh, oh, I sinned. I accidentally said something or I, I, I was, you know, whatever it might be. 
I got upset in traffic, you know, and shook my fist at someone. Oh, no, now, you know, if I die, I'm going to go to hell. No, no, no. If we're walking in the light as he is in the light, we're his children. There's a continual cleansing from our sins. So I'm not saying you have to be walking in perfection, but we need to be walking with a clean conscience and walking in accordance with God's will. We can't just be out there being rebels and then say, oh, but I've got a free ticket with God. I can write my ticket. You understand? So we have to be walking in God's will. And then the last thing very quickly that I want to say to you is that we, we, can, we have to be persistent. We have to be persistent. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks will receive. Anyone who seeks will find. And the door will be opened to those who knock. And all of this is in the present tense. So there is a persistence to our prayers. There are people that say, if you pray for something more than once, you're demonstrating a lack of faith. So only pray for it once and never again, and then God will at some point listen and maybe answer in his timing. That's really a wrong teaching in the worst of ways because the New Testament is very clear on this thing of persistence, of coming to God. Now, if God says no... We're not going to keep coming. It, it, you know, once he's made his will clear on something. Oh, but Lord, I really wanted to marry that supermodel. Oh, Lord, I just can't believe. You know, whatever. You know, and, but if we have God's will, so you have an, a loved one that's not saved, and you're believing God for them. We already have. It's not God's will for any to perish. So we can come to God again and again and again. I read a book by one man one time, and he said, I only prayed for my children's salvation once, never again. One time I did it, and I marked that off, and that's it, because that's all I... Whew. It's just, it's not scripture. When you ask for something, you don't just ask once. When you're seeking for something, you don't just say, well, it's not here, okay, that's it. No, you're seeking. You're looking all over. As many places you can get to where that might be. And when you knock on someone's door, how many of you go up and just do this? No, nope, they're not there. I'm gone. If you know the person is in there, it's nighttime, you've walked up, and all of a sudden the lights go out, but you know they're there. You're not just doing that. You're going to keep going. I'm not giving up, and we're just going to keep going until you open that door. You better open that door. And you say, oh, come on. It's not like that. That was the parable of Jesus. And he was talking about prayer when he said uh, a man comes uh, from a faraway country, uh, surprises uh, some, some family members, and they don't have bread, and they have to go next door to the neighbor. Hey, I need bread. Can I borrow some bread from you? No, 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 no. I'm in bed, man. Don't get me up. I need bread. I've got visitors, and it's important that I get... Finally, the guy gets up because of what? Persistence. And Jesus links that with prayer. God wants us to come to him. I, I'm just closing on this point. I want you to understand this, that, that God, it, we're not bothering God. We're not bugging God. The Lord wants us to come, and especially when we're coming to intercede, the Lord wants us to intercede. He, oh, above all else, the Lord looked for someone to stand in the gap. God's looking, I believe, God is looking for someone today, Christians today, that will say, I am going to make it a part of my life. Intercession is important. I'm going to spend time interceding because I believe that God answers prayer. And I know that God hears when I call to him in sincere, true faith. I'm walking with the Lord and I'm calling out on behalf of other people. That is selfless. God wants that. God honors that. You and I can be praying people. How many want a greater, more effective prayer life? Amen. Even more than you've had now. I do. I want, it to, I want to keep growing always in my prayer life. I don't want to ever come to a place where I'm satisfied in my walk with the Lord. I always want to keep growing in the Lord. And I'm, I'm sure that there's not one person here that could honestly say, you know, I mean... There's, I, I don't need to grow at all in prayer. I'm fine. I mean, everything that I pray for is just answered on the spot right there. That's none of us. That's none of us. We all want to grow in the Lord. And we want to be like, again, Abraham. He didn't stop at 50. He didn't stop at 45 or 40 or 30 or 20. He stopped at 10. And by the way, 10 still wasn't enough, was it? As we come back and round back to the text, 10 was not enough. There weren't even 10 righteous people in the city. The city still ended up being destroyed. 
But it, it's kind of those, one of those great what ifs. What if Abraham had kept going? And we don't have the answer to that. But what we do know is that the Lord heard and he was always responsive to Abraham's intercession. And God is responsive to our intercession. There's no one in your family that's a lost cause. Brother Ivor, if you would come. There's no one in your family or your friends or that, that when it comes to intercession for their soul or intercession for them to be delivered and set free. There are people that need to be set free from all types of bondages. God will set the captive free. That's why Jesus came. And the Lord will do that. But you know what? He wants us to cooperate with him in prayer. If that's your desire, especially dads, husbands, fathers, to be the priest of the home and to really intercede for your family members, as your wife and your children, whoever, we're all interceding one for another. But God, he wants to do a great work. He wants to see a people in this country that will rise up and be true prayer warriors. Above all else, prayer warriors. Would you bow your heads with me right now and let's just open, open up the beginning of the application of this message today by going to the Lord in prayer. And as we pray together, we're just going to pray, God, make me a better prayer warrior. Make, let my, my time in prayer with you, let it grow. Lord, teach me not how to pray, but teach me to pray. Heavenly Father, right now in Jesus' name, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord, we began this service with a time of praise and worship through song, and we ask that your glory would be revealed through the preaching of your word, and that every heart would confess that Jesus is Lord. I pray if there's anyone here that has not confessed, they have not believed. This is what it's all about. We believe you. Even if we come and we say, Lord, help me in my unbelief, I'm going to come and I'm going to ask and I'm going to open my heart to you. Lord, we pray, those of us that are here as believers, I ask for myself and everyone here, make us greater prayer warriors. Surely there is a great need for intercession today. Make us, Lord, make us intercessors. Do this work in our heart and in our life. I pray that we would see fruit from our prayers, Lord. We don't want to just offer up prayers and, and all of them feel like they're hitting the ceiling and coming back down. So I pray that we would put into practice all these aspects of effective praying. Lord, that we would believe and we would trust you. We walk in you. Lord, that we would have sincere, true faith. That we would pray in Jesus' name. That we would pray your will. That we would pray as we are walking in your will. Lord, that we would be persistent in our prayers. Those five elements. Bring them together and make this church and make these people, God, a praying people. Make me a greater prayer warrior than ever before. Put upon us that heart of intercession for a lost and a dying world. Even right now, we would just lift up silently the name of of that person in our family or friends that we have. We just lift them up to you right now in Jesus' name. Save them. Save their soul. Soften their heart. Soften their heart, Lord. Do a mighty work. A mighty work. A saving work. Open their eyes. Open their ears that they could see, that they could hear. Lord, let even now faith begin to well up within their heart as you by your spirit draw them, convict them, show them that life without you what's the purpose of it without you if we're only here and then we go wow just a short time on this earth and that's it no lord we have a soul we're going to move into eternity god there's something greater than us you are our creator show those that we're praying for show them that show them that jesus is the only way that our consciences can be cleansed that our souls can be made new show them that lord and use us, use us as prayer warriors. In Jesus' wonderful and mighty name, we ask these things. We believe for these things. And Father, we pray a special blessing for our earthly fathers, for the fathers that are here. You are our heavenly Father, and we love you. We thank you, Lord, for earthly dads as well. Bless them today on this Father's Day. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask all of these things. Amen. And amen.